you know, we can't change national culture. Here we are, and we are here in Japan or even in the US, we are struggling with many of the same issues, but we can change organizational culture. Each of us can make an impact, and we are just delighted to open now with our keynote presentations featuring two very special people who have a lot of experience and wealth of knowledge to share with us. I'd like to start by um, first introducing uh, the Managing Director for Japan Korea of Kellogg Japan, Ms. Yukari Inoue, who will be speaking for us on organizational culture changing, excuse me, organizational culture change drives business results. Inoue-san has been leading Kellogg Japan since 2013 and has seen a tremendous shift in the number of women in senior leadership positions during her tenure. Speaking with Inoue-san earlier, she noted that having started her career at P&G here in Kansai and working solely in multinational firms for her 30-year career, it feels extremely natural for her to see women and to be around women in senior leadership positions, but also appreciates that this puts her in a unique position in Japan. That said, she has experienced more than her fair share of being the only female at the room. Sometimes it seems like there's an assigned number for women at the table and it's only one. And I think that's what we're trying to change here today. And this is where she's putting so much of her effort in being a strong proponent to build in the behaviors of an inclusive culture at Kellogg and beyond. She also sits as an outside director on the board of Suntor Suntory Beverage and Food, one of a small but growing number of Japanese female outside board members in Japan. Thank you so much, Inoue-san, for joining us today. I leave it to you. Uh -uh. Thank you very much, Marianne. I'm so delighted to be here. And first of all, congratulations to everybody who contributed to make this uh, wonderful event happen again. Uh, it's wonderful to see the momentum going on as a part of a nationwide movement uh, to enhance the role of working women in Japan. Today, I've been asked to speak around the theme of organizational culture change drives business results. There are actually two messages in this I will emphasize today. First, the inclusion of women in leadership, senior leadership, really correlates to better business results. Second, organizational culture change is required to move women into senior leadership. I'd like to start with the first point. Including women in senior leadership correlates with better business results. Starting with P&G, now at Kellogg, I have been working in multinational companies for 30 years. In this hard time, I had had the privilege to work with brilliant female senior leadership. Those are delivering business results consistently and sustainably. Seeing the success of these women, I have no doubt that women can take a senior leadership role in Japan. I was pleased to recently find that research reported by McKinsey in 2015 and also Conferry Hay Group in 2016 substantiates my conviction. Fundamentally, to keep winning in the current very competitive market, we need to change ourselves from internally focused to externally focused. In other words, we need to change our strategy from inside out to outside in. You know, women are, have a half of the population and 60% of the consumer goods purchase decision is made by the women. We cannot ignore these statistics. The McKinsey report states that the inclusion of women in leadership brings critical elements, perspective into the meeting room. It is, it is essential to include women in order to strengthen customer orientation 
I have seen many, many great results in past 30 years, and just recently found out I added one sales member into my sales team. She brought very, very articulated shopper insight to develop a customer plan, which influenced positively in those approaches to broader uh, sales teams. And it's also, second point, to keep uh, adding value for customers in this rapidly changing environment, company needs to consistently come up with value added, better solutions and interventions. Diverse and inclusive leadership will foster innovation and creativity through a wider variety of problem solving perspectives and ideas. At Kellogg, we believe that in inclusion of the women and different cultural background adds the strength in the innovation. Lastly, and most importantly, in today's complex, fast-based, interconnected environment, in order to succeed, I believe a company needs to be run by a leadership team that knows how to collaborate and has a resilience to deal with ambiguity. The Corn Ferry report indicates that there is a correlation between high emotional intelligence and leaders who deliver the results. And women outperform 11 out of 12 key emotional intelligence competencies, such as emotional self-awareness and demonstrating emotional sympathy. Women are better at using soft skills, critical for effective leadership and senior business leaders, as the senior business leaders. This statement is so true and provocative, indeed. It is based on 55,000 professionals surveyed across 90 countries at all levels of management data collected from 2011 to 2015. What does this mean to, for, to Kellogg? At Kellogg, we firmly believe that having a diverse workforce at all levels is good for the company and make, makes good business. That's why Kellogg is so committed to advancing women. Nearly 40% of the Kellogg Board of Directors is now female. This is more than doubled the Fortune 500 average. Women currently hold five out of the 13 board seats. In Asia Pacific, currently four out of seven country managers are women. Actually, over the last three years, the number of females on the Kellogg Asia Pacific leadership team has increased from one out of 16 to five out of 16. In the top 100 leaders in Kellogg Asia Pacific, 34% of the female compared to 13% three years ago. Four out of seven uh, members of the Kellogg Japan leadership team are women more than doubled the ratio in three years. I can share a few examples among many stories of women in senior leadership who positively affected uh, business results in Kellogg. For example, Latin America regional female president transformed Latin America as a cohesive winning and growing region. Canada female general manager has been consistently driving profitable growth. Among my colleagues in Asia Pacific, India female general manager built a strong platform for increasing penetration of cereal in emerging markets and created a strong innovation hub for Asia Pacific. Australia and New Zealand uh, general manager the first female general manager in 92 years of operation begins turning around their business by re-engineering matured serial category. 
So yes, having women in senior leadership positions correlates with better business results. We've seen that at Kellogg. So then, we need to look at the second point. What kind of organization culture is required to support the development of women and get them into these senior leadership roles? What did it take to make this happen at Kellogg? We can say that organizational culture embrace the values and behaviors that contribute to the unique environment of an organization. Today, I'd like to highlight the importance of behaviors. As behaviors, it's something everyone can, everyone can see, and they are driven by companies' values and beliefs. Top management must be highlight the importance of behaviors as, and ensure that desired behavior is aligned with the company's objectives and values. I like to share two key commitments have made significant differences in driving leadership behavior at Kellogg. Since 2012, we have diversity and inclusion accountability built into our executive leaders annual incentive performance bonus program. A certain percentage is weighted towards achieving parity or better uh, rates in the area of hiring, promotion, and retention of senior positioned women. Globally and in US, we include minorities. Earlier, I shared the improvements we've seen in our numbers since making this commitment. Kellogg is, is also committed to talent development. We conduct annual global talent reviews across our organization where the talent is assessed and career growth needs and development are discussed and plans made. The CEO and global leadership team spend a couple of days annually to review key talents. The Asia Pacific leadership team does the same, as does the local leadership team. Through this, we support all our employees, maximize their full potential, and ensure that women can receive equal opportunity for their development. Supporting these commitments through key behaviors, I believe that senior leaders can make a personal impact on women's advancement I'd like to share a couple of personal experience. First, I believe that succession planning is one of the most important roles we have as a leader, and it's critical to our success in promoting women to senior leadership position. At Kellogg, once we had a talent discussion and are setting a successor candidate for a key role, we assign a mentor, a kind of sponsor, from top management. So let's say my direct report has defined as a successor candidate for key role. My job is to ensure that we are providing appropriate development plans, such as assigning very challenging projects, helping her to attend Kellogg executive program, and staying in touch with her mentor to notice if she continues to be happy and on track. On a regular basis, as my, as, you know, her direct boss, pay attention to her growth and development, not only from a work perspective, but also from a family or personal point of view, so that she can manage both areas well. Weekly one-on-one -on -one conversation with her is a critical opportunity to understand where she stands and provides coaching moment. Second example, ongoing conversations and mentoring are critical to help women to unleash their potential. And this is one way each of us as a leaders can maximize their impact. I had a woman quite senior and capable with tremendous potential. I offered her the opportunity to walk outside of the country. 
However, she was reluctant because uh, she has a husband and teenage daughter, and most importantly, she is happy where she stands. However, after two years of observing me at work, and also one-on-one -on -one mentoring session quarterly, she started to think about stretching her career. She moved to a new role with her daughter to take a regional role in Singapore. Through this, we can give a new dimension to future uh, female talents. It took time and patience to support her growth. I didn't quit having the conversations when she initially said no. She needs time to shift her mindset. She later told me that she had put limitation to herself, but once she started thinking in new way, she found the confidence to take a risk. This is a fantastic transformation. As leaders, if we want to have more women in leadership role, we must commit to demonstrating behaviors like this that support changes in individuals. Lastly, while I have emphasized today diversity in terms of gender, I'd like to also mention that Kellogg is committed to promote diversity in terms of national culture. Just two years ago, we launched a new executive cross-cultural mentoring program. This two-year program is distinctive in both its focus and level of participation. In the program, Kellogg's most senior leaders serve as men mentors. The mentees are senior managers from across the globe, and the program is deliberately cross-functional. A key purpose is to improve retention and increase diversity in the pipeline. Feedback has been incredibly favorable, and the program continues. As a part of this program, I'm mentoring a US-based senior sales leader, male, who has never worked outside of the US. Outside of this program, I'm also mentoring five people, one Japanese male uh, working in Singapore, two Indian males, and two Korean females. Mentoring is one of the best ways you can cascade new, new behaviors to another level of the organization. I believe you will be hearing more about the importance of mentoring in one of the sessions later today. In summary, Kellogg is committed to a diverse and inclusive organization culture, both in terms of gender and nationality. We know that our success in continuing to build this into our DNA will be directly related to our success in the market in Japan and across the globe. I hope through the rest of the, the program today, all of us will experience new insights that will contribute to the organizational cultural change that supports the advancement of the women. May each of you find out the key you need to become a change agent of the cultural change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inoue-san, for sharing your experience and, and sharing those inspiring numbers. That's really a tremendous shift that you've seen. Inoue-san will also be on our panel for unconscious bias in the afternoon, uh, sharing, I'm sure, what are a lot of discoveries and un things to uncover in terms of how we can really create the leadership behaviors that will make a difference. Thank you again. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, who will be speaking on diversity solutions for Japan, building onto this theme of why organizational culture change is so critical for Japan right now. We're delighted to have with us Mr. Gerald Lima, Managing Partner and Representative Director of Cylon Capital Global, and Chairman 
of the Catalyst Board of Advisors in Japan. For those of you who aren't familiar with Catalyst, Catalyst is an ex a global expert on diversity and inclusion in the workplace based in the US, and they bring a real variety of research and practical tools that they share with organizations in Japan and around the globe to increase women's representation in a meaningful way. Gerald's understanding of this challenge of increasing the representation of women at the senior spots in leadership is very deep with nearly 15 years of leadership experience in Japan, first as representative director and chairman of Abbott Japan, and more recently from 2005 to 2015 as president, Asia Pacific, and chairman, Japan, for Baxter International. At Baxter, he led critical cultural changes through developing new work practices that made a lasting impact both on productivity and business results, as well as employee engagement and satisfaction. So we look forward, Gerald, to hearing your thoughts today on what is necessary to reshape how women are represented in the workforce here in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm delighted to see this. Um, uh, many of you, of course, represent uh, great companies in the Kansai area. And to have this kind of representation now, it started as a only Tokyo-based, but this is the second year in Kansai. So I think that you must be very proud of what you are able to put together as a program. And also, I, I want to thank, of course, the chapter as well as the sponsors. I think it's, uh, it's really important that this level of um, commitment and voice in Japan continues to be uh, sustained. So um, what I wanted to talk about today is practical, uh, a couple of practical examples of how companies can change their practices. Uh, the theme of the uh, meeting today is driving business growth through organizational change. And I think uh, people believe that Japan is difficult to change and it's hard. But I, I think that many companies are, and maybe many of your companies, are showing that it is possible to change in Japan and that you can take small steps that go a long way into improving diversity and inclusion. So let me see if this works. However, let me just make a little joke. So when, uh, when you say, who wants change? Everybody's in favor of it. But as long as we don't have to change. And I think um, we have a lot of macro uh, benefits uh, from change. You know, We can get laws. We can get the government to help us. We can actually even believe that our companies want us to change. But I think the most important thing is what each one of us does every day to improve diversity and inclusion. And uh, how each one of us, whether we have the managers of team of one or team of two, individual contributors or team of 100, each person can make a, a significant contribution. So um, we have, of course, this year, uh, the Women Advancement Law, which uh, actually I think is very positive. Uh, the reporting uh, is ongoing, and uh, with uh, all these government processes, as we get better at the transparency and analyzing which companies are doing better in very many dimensions, I think in the years to come, that will be very beneficial. However, uh, the situation today is like this. And you probably are familiar with this. Uh, this is the very famous M curve. But in Japan, it's particularly pronounced in the middle. So for men or women, the most productive professional period of their lives is between, let's say, 25 years old to 55. Why? Because this is after you leave school. This is when you take progressive uh, assignments. You can see the bar is, are the men. And if you look around the world, the women and the men in Europe or in the US follow very similar pattern in which you reach employment, you maintain for around 30 years, and then obviously you start to decline. In Japan, there is that dip that you can see between the 25 to 45, 50 year old. And this is the biggest gap in Japan. Uh, we know there are many issues in Japan due to you know, aging population and the fact that around 32% of the population will decline by 2060. 
But what is interesting about this and, and sad about this is that we are losing, of course, the women in the prime uh, age of their lives when they could be contributing more because they drop out of the workforce. And this happens because of this, this leaking pipeline. So women, you probably maybe have seen this before, women uh, join the university around 50%, 49%, then they join uh, as professional employees at entry level around 45%, and they basically vanish. It drops from 30, 45 to 11, and then numbers, marginal numbers, right? And this happens because there are a lot of, many reasons, but uh, in many ways is because there are a lot of work practices that make it very difficult in Japan for women to continue to work throughout those um, uh, very productive years. And uh, I can tell you that once a, a woman leaves the workforce in Japan more than five years because of childbearing or any other reason, it's really hard to bring them back. And uh, actually, it's really hard to even find them. Uh, in my previous company, I had a project just to find. There are supposed to be around 2 million professional women in Tokyo. And there will be, I don't know, probably comparatively speaking, maybe 800,000 in, in Osaka and or Kansai area. And you cannot find them. You know, they just disappear. They disappear because the recruiters don't take their, their uh, CVs after uh, two, three years. They disappear because they don't feel that they can contribute again. They disappear because many companies maybe uh, don't want to use them because they have a, a, a significant gap. But it's a, it's a waste of talent because all of them graduated from the same universities as Japanese men. And therefore, once they are gone, this contributes not only to the fact that they are not productive anymore, but also it contributes to the decline of the talent pool of Japan. So. That's, uh, uh, that is actually a, a very significant uh, issue. And then I will talk a little more about some examples of companies that have tried to improve that. Uh, maybe you have seen this is a recent uh, Japanese study, but this has been verified in Europe uh, as well as in the US. It's not, there is no surprise that uh, diversity uh, leads to better business results. The reality is that the world is diverse. There is no doubt about that. We, even in, in a very homogeneous country like Japan, you can have a lot of conversations about which recipe of you know, ramen is better, Hokkaido ramen or Osaka ramen, or you can have all kinds of conversations of the diversity that exists within countries. It also exists within education backgrounds. It exists uh, within industries, of course. So there is diversity everywhere you look at. And not surprisingly, because society reflects that diversity, women must be represented, and companies that have achieved that representation have better business results. They reflect society better, they reflect their customer base better. Uh, you heard from Inoue-san, you know, how their initiatives in, in Kellogg have reflected uh, how uh, women are making the purchasing decisions, and the, the, the examples that Inoue-san made uh, are companies within her group that have done better because they reflect this uh, women uh, representation. So, so there is no doubt that it will improve if companies are more diverse and more inclusive. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, and this is the, the key message, is, is how uh, the work practices uh, really in Japan and around the world, but in particular in Japan, really have a huge impact in productivity as well as retention. And this is very much linked to, uh, to gender. So for example, on the uh, one side, uh, I guess you have it on the left hand uh, side, uh, you can see that uh, the impact of uh, flexible working arrangements, just FWA, um, has on gender. And when women have more flexible uh, working arrangements, they really benefit the most. It also benefits men, but particularly women, because you will see also in the white paper of ACCJ, uh, in Japan, the amount of work that women do in childcare and housework is three times more than uh, what the uh, men 
uh, in the U.S., for example, have to do uh, uh, the, what they do in the U.S. or they do in Europe. So because the burden of the home, both children and housework, uh, is falls uh, heavily on the women, these flexible work arrangements make a big difference in Japan uh, to be more successful and to lead to retention of talent. So as you heard before, um, I'm, I'm proud to be in the Board of Directors, the Global Board of Directors of Catalyst in New York, as well as uh, I'm the chair of the Catalyst uh, Board of Advisors in Japan. You know, Wesan is in that, in, in that board, and you will hear later from uh, Laura Younger, who is the Executive Director of ACCJ. She's also on the board, and we have uh, uh, four others that are very accomplished business executives in Japan. And I'm proud of what uh, Catalyst is doing in Japan. We established maybe a year ago, and uh, you will hear a couple of other of the Catalyst colleagues later today. But we are trying to look for very practical solutions that can work in Japan. And some of them are uh, very simple, as you can see here. One of them is explaining to employees why inclusion matters. So diversity, as uh, I said before, is all around us. But inclusion is something that we have to decide to do. We want we, Inclusion means we want to hear a different point of view. We want to see a different perspective. We want to bring people from different backgrounds, educational or any other type of backgrounds. And we want to welcome them into our organization so we can be richer as a company. The second one is creating workplaces that really uh, don't penalize women for childbearing age uh, and uh, taking time off for maternity leave. Uh, this is particularly important in Japan because as I said, many of them drop out and then it's really difficult for them to come back. So companies that have policies that not only don't discourage but encourage childbearing. It, it is really an interesting thing. Who is against having children? I mean, first of all, this popul the population is declining. So obviously, children are the only counter argument for declining population. And the second thing is everybody is someone's child, that's for sure. right? So encouraging childbearing and, uh, and, and having the women to have the opportunity to have children, have a good working arrangement, and come back to work is obviously a very good and sound policy from a company point of view. The third one is the example that all of us make and exhibit as leaders, and can be from the top and can be from anywhere that you sit in the organization, sends really a great message to everyone. It is amazing how people observe leaders and see what they do. And, and what they do is what gets reinforced within the company. So we have a responsibility to be the best models of that behavior. Uh, we heard something about talent management before. Obviously, looking at uh, the, the women that we have in the talent pipeline and making sure that they get the right and fair opportunities to advance. And then, last but not least, uh, I will say that uh, Catalyst has been doing this for uh, 50 years or more. And uh, we have an enormous amount of tools and research that. Uh, that help companies uh, implement practical programs. So let me give you a couple of examples. One of them is Manulife uh, 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 best practice. Uh, Manulife uh, actually uh, started um, a, a very extensive training program in which the CEO actually conducts every single of the diversity and inclusion uh, training uh, sessions. And uh, he basically wanted to send a message that this is important and I conduct the sessions, and therefore, uh, all of you basically have to pay attention. And, uh, and this has been cascading very well. Uh, the other piece is they established uh, the Japan Women Alliance. And within this alliance, they have uh, some mentorship men to women, as well as uh, they have a, a number of speakers and networking events in which they are able to, uh, to gather, and women uh, actually can exchange what challenges they are, they are having in the company and have a, a, a very good conversation, not only within themselves, but also with management to remove some of the barriers. So this is a good example in Japan. And then last but not least, 
Uh, this is the company I was leading before. And uh, for the last five years, I guess we started something called the work style revolution. And this work style revolution was about changing basically all the ways in which we worked. And um, uh, so, uh, as you know, many companies have a structure, launch hours, start hours, beginning time, ending time, and, and many regulations. So we, the first thing we did was we established a program called Diversity for No Reason. Um, and this one basically allowed flexibility, complete flexibility. So you, uh, every employee was able to go to his or her manager, uh, male or female, and say, I would like to have a different work arrangement. I would like to work only Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday and Thursday, I would like to work from home or Starbucks or wherever. And unless the manager had an objection that was well qualified, the manager had to approve this flexibility for no reason, right? So this actually uh, led to a, a huge change in how we analyze people's performance because there is a high degree of face time required in Japan. And by doing this, basically we put the burden on the manager to say, I don't need to see you all the time, but I would like you to get this done by Friday. And therefore, the work changed from hours at the office versus what do we execute, what projects would do we compete, complete uh, on a weekly basis or any time frame. This actually changed a lot how our managers uh, started to manage people and also how the employees took responsibility for their own time. So they could, you know, within reason, everybody came to the office, you know, every week. People did not leave for months and months, but, but they had the opportunity to adjust their schedule. So we did that. We also stopped overtime two nights a week. So Wednesdays and Fridays, 6 p.m., literally, we turn off the lights, the air conditioning, the heating, and, uh, and then people are supposed to go home. Believe it or not, sometimes we found some people under the desk, <laughs> hiding, still wishing to work more. But, you know, overall, most of the people really understood that the message was go home. Go home, go to the gym, go to the bar, whatever, but don't stay here because you should adjust your work style uh, to address that. We also, one of the biggest issues, as you know, and I, I talked before, is uh, having women return uh, from maternity leave. So we had set our target 100% uh, of women to return. So we offer three-year maternity leave, uh, leave and guaranteed the job once they return. And nobody took the three years, but it really made a big difference into how they, uh, uh, they were able to deal with all the pressures, family pressures and so forth. 100% of them returned last year, and uh, they, uh, they came back within one year, a year and a half. Uh, so it was very positive. And the last one I wanted to talk about was um, uh, this Ecubos campaign. All of you probably are familiar with the Ecumen government campaign. So we took uh, that message and we changed it into a way to recognize individually uh, someone that was displaying the behaviors of diversity and inclusion. And so if, for example, someone did something about a meeting or rescheduled something around someone's needs, you could give a sticker to the other person to recognize your colleague. It was supposed to be the boss, but at the end it was the boss, colleague, anybody. You could give, men could give to women, women to men, it didn't matter. And it was a, a small token to reflect the fact that they were living these behaviors. And this is where I come back to what I started, which is it, it doesn't require a huge company program. There are so many things we can do on a daily basis to reinforce these behaviors and to make sure that our colleagues, everybody that works with us, understands that these are just small things we do. If, if you cannot attend a five o'clock meeting because you have to some other commitment, your mother is ill or your child needs to be picked up, rescheduling the meeting for next day at 10 in the morning is leaving that behavior. So uh, this was very successful. People started displaying all the stickers on the, on the desk and the boards and things like that. And it was a way for everybody could participate 
and, and uh, feel that they were doing something for their colleagues. So that's it. I am told that I'm over time. So uh, <laughs> I, I thank you very much once again. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jared. I really love that message, and I, I would like to go to many companies and see lots of stickers on the doors. I think you know that we can each make a difference, and that inclusion is something we decide to do by the small decisions that we make every day. What a thought-provoking and inspiring start to our day. And thank you to Gerald and Inoue San and to our other uh, speakers this morning. I would just like to mention that all of our speakers throughout the day will be presented with this beautiful uh, artist print, uh, which has been donated by the artist Roy Akavi, who unfortunately is not with us today. You can see this on display in the foyer as well. Uh, this is the second in a series. Last year we pr presented a similar um, print, but different to, to our speaker. So it's a, a fun tradition now that we are carrying on. And I wanted to recognize him for that.